Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Gilbert Hosts. Today, our broadcast is entitled, I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, now what? And today, we're going to delve into the many issues faced by people who have just received a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And this is all just in time for Parkinson's Awareness Month, which starts tomorrow. Now, I'm very excited to introduce today's guest who's with us today. Dr. Stephanie Bissonette. Dr. Bissonette will start us off with a brief presentation and then she will help us answer your questions. Now, those of you who expect or expected Dr. Linda Nabobi to be our guest, don't worry, she will be joining us on a future broadcast. Now, let me in introduce Dr. Bissonette. Dr. Bissonette is a movement disorder specialist at Boston Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts. She received her master's of public health in health law and bioethics from Boston University and then attended medical school at University of New England College of Osteopathic Medicine. After a research fellowship at the National Institutes of Health and a neurology residency at Ohio State University, she returned to Boston for a movement disorders fellowship at Boston University's Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center. She stayed on as faculty and is now an assistant professor of neurology there where she sees people with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. She also leads Boston University's Global Health Neurology Initiative to Haiti, and her current research and community outreach concentrates on the Haitian diaspora. Her current project is focused on developing educational videos for patients who identify as Black or African American, Hispanic, or those with limited English proficiency with a focus on Spanish and Haitian Creole. So welcome, Dr. Bissonnette. We would love if you could kick us off with a brief presentation on this extremely important topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilbert. I'm so excited to be here today. I think this is not only a really important topic, but the topic that I think of as all those questions that you have after you leave your neurologist's office. So hopefully this brief introduction can give you a little bit of information and I'm looking forward to hearing your questions at the end. Let's start by backing up a little and talking about how Parkinson's is diagnosed. So. Unfortunately, we don't have a good what we call biomarker for Parkinson's disease, meaning that there's not a real way that I can draw blood or do a test and say, yep, you definitively have Parkinson's disease. So what that means is that we really rely on a neurologic history and exam, and we look for something called the cardinal motor features. These include a tremor that's present at rest when the patient is not actively moving their hands, such as watching TV or in conversation, slowness of movements, stiffness of movements, and problems maintaining balance. Early in the disease, some of the things that we look for include decreased blink rate, where someone may actually look like they're staring for a little while, changes in handwriting, where it's actually small and more difficult to read as someone is writing, stooped postures or hunched shoulders, and then characteristic walking that we think of with shuffled gait, meaning that your feet are actually taking smaller steps and they're not lifting off the ground as much. There are also something called non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and early on, the ones that we really ask about and look for are things such such as constipation, loss of smell, which I like to say Parkinson's had a, um, a, a you know, this was their, their symptom before COVID came around. Um, what's called REM behavior sleep disorder, which means that instead of being paralyzed in your deepest uh, stage of sleep, you actually have movements and you can act out kicking, punching, screaming. And then mood disorders, especially depression, can be early on. Now, there are some tests that we may get when we are suspicious of Parkinson's disease. The one that you may be most familiar with is something called a DAT scan or a dopamine transport scan. This is a almost like a PET scan that actually looks at the, the level of dopamine that's being picked up in the brain. And if that is low, it can be a sign of a Parkinsonian syndrome. Um, this is especially helpful in people with a tremor that may have um, a family history of tremor, something like an essential tremor or an action tremor, it can help us see whether or not those Parkinsonian symptoms are actually due to something due to lack of dopamine. And then there's also tests where you can look for the abnormal protein that is implicated or that causes Parkinson's disease, either in the spinal fluid of a patient, or we're now starting to look for it in the skin in a couple different areas. So we do a little small punch biopsy and look for this alpha-synuclein protein. 
So now that you know a little bit about how we diagnose Parkinson's disease, the real question is, what do you do now? So the first thing is take a deep breath and try to relax as best you can. Parkinson's is definitely a new challenge and something that is going to change the way in which you live your life, but it's going to hopefully change it for the better. One thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna educate yourself. So the right websites are really important. While it's really great to use social media, Facebook, Instagram, to have community and to find other people who are going through what you're going through, make sure that when you're looking for actual facts about Parkinson's, you're using websites such as the American Parkinson Disease Association, the Parkinson's Foundation, the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Websites from um, hospitals can be really great sources of information as well. Um, definitely consider making an appointment with a movement disorder specialist. So these are neurologists who had additional years of training to learn specifically about how to recognize and treat Parkinson's Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, as well as to um, what, what they keep up with the treatments and the trials that are going on. By far the most important thing you can do from this point forward, from the moment you get diagnosed, is to start moving. And we're going to talk more about that in the next couple of slides. And then reconsider your diet, and we'll talk about that at the end as well. So let's talk a little bit about exercise. What is the best exercise you should do for Parkinson's disease? We believe that, par that exercise not only helps control the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, but in animal models, it actually may slow down the progression of the disease. And so exercise is by far the most important thing you can do. And we typically recommend that you try to incorporate these four things, some sort of endurance, some sort of strength training, some balance training, and stretching. And you don't have to do one exercise to fit each of these categories. Sometimes things like yoga check off a couple of these boxes, such as balance and strength training. So if you don't exercise, then you might be wondering, well, how do I start exercising? What do I do next for exercise? So one thing to do is ask your doctor. Um, I often tell my patients that when I tell you to exercise, I don't mean I want you to sign up for the Boston Marathon. What I want you to do is to start small. Um, I want you to do things like getting up and walking in your neighborhood, maybe twice a week to start five to 10 minutes. We usually say moderate exercise. So your heart rate increasing for a um, period of each, about 30 minutes, three or four times a week is all you need. Definitely one key way to start an exercise routine is to meet with a physical and occupational therapist. They are trained at how to put together an exercise plan for you, especially those who have um, experience in Parkinson's disease and treating patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, and they can really help kind of guide you and, and kind of spark that exercise bug in you. Um, the best exercise to do is an exercise that you're going to enjoy. This is where people start to do things like rock steady boxing or pickleball is really common around here. I'm not sure if it is where you're from, um, but those are things that people enjoy and that potentially um, can help your symptoms, help your Parkinson's disease, and are fun. And then consider an exercise in which you learn a new motor skill. So that's where something like boxing that can also work on your balance comes in. Um, things that, that help with hand-eye coordination can be really helpful as well. So next, let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about um, your diet. So I get asked this question all the time, doctor, what is the best diet for Parkinson's disease? What do I have to change? And the answer is a healthy Mediterranean diet is always the best diet for the brain and is probably the best diet for Parkinson's disease. So this includes eating lots of healthy vegetables and fruits, whole grains, legumes, which are things like beans, peas, and lentils, nuts, low-fat protein, um, and things like olive oils instead of things like um, vegetable oil. And probably the thing that I tell all of my patients right up front is that this is not just a disease that you and your, your family and your friends are going to be dealing with, but also you're going to put together a healthcare team. So you're actually going to assemble a group of people who are going to help you to manage your symptoms, um, treat all the different aspects of Parkinson's disease that you may experience in the future. So you're going to have your movement disorder specialist or your neurologist who helps you with diagnosis and changing your meds, but you're also going to have your rehabilitation specialist. You're going to have your psychosocial support. You're going to have your exercise and wellness teachers and your primary care and other specialists are so very important as things like constipation, urinary symptoms all come up. These are things where we want other experts to be weighing in and we want communication between the whole team. And that's what we're going for. So 
you're probably thinking this is all fine and well, but the real question I have is, should I be on medication and which medication should I be on? So I like to think of the decision to start a medication as a very personal decision for every person with Parkinson's disease. It is a decision that I think of as a shared decision between myself and my patients. I often will recommend medication when I see that patients have functional limitations. So they're having a hard time doing their um, activities of daily living, things like cooking their meals, um, brushing their teeth, showering. I often have patients say to me, it takes me two hours to get dressed now and it used to take me five minutes. So those are, are things that I listen for when I'm examining my patient to help guide me on whether or not we should be thinking about starting medication. Or if you're not able to exercise maximally because your symptoms are that severe, so your balance is that far off, your shuffling is that bad, you really can't get out of a chair to do some of the up and down movements that are required in, say, your boxing class, that's when we should think about starting medications. But again, this is something that it does not have a hard and fast rule. So there's not a set time when medication is more beneficial than other times. There is not a set time in which one medication should be started versus another. This is an ongoing conversation. So with all of that information in that short period of time, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Gilbert, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Dr. Bissonette, for all that important information. Uh, the questions have been rolling in. We already have probably more than we can answer, and we're just at the start of our Q&A. So uh, we're, we're now going to uh, take our audience questions. I also want to remind you that if you have a question that comes up now, please submit your question, and we will try to answer as many as you can. And again, we may display your question along with the name and photo you're logged in with, and I want to make that clear as well. So let's start off. We have already a couple of questions about DAT scans. So we have a question from Anne, with, who asks, do you recommend a DAT scan to have a baseline so that you can see how the disease evolves with time? And a related question from Dan is, isn't a DAT scan a conclusive test? Why is there still uncertainty, be, uncertainty about somebody having Parkinson's or not? Maybe you can tackle both of those together. Sure. I think these are, are really wonderful questions. And, and Anne really gets to kind of the, the essence of what a DAT scan does. So we look at the dopamine and we use how bright basically those areas of the brain are to tell us whether or not they are a normal amount of, of dopamine or is it less dopamine than would be expected. And the, the real thing that we don't understand is how it changes over time. So we have kind of a cutoff for what is normal and abnormal, but we don't actually know trends. So is there a certain level that says I'm in early Parkinson's? Is there a level that says I'm in middle stage Parkinson's? Um, I think that that's something that we're really still investigating. And a lot of trials that are following people over time are actually getting routine DAT scans. So things like what's called the PPMI trial through the Michael J. Fox Foundation actually does a DAT scan yearly. And the reason for that is to try and kind of tease out and be a little bit more specific for some of these questions. Now, Dan's question is really interesting. Isn't a DAT scan conclusive. And I think given the right patient and the right symptoms, a DAT scan can be conclusive. Where it's a little bit uncertain is that there are things called, called atypical Parkinsonisms. I like to call them the cousins of Parkinson's disease, where you can, in the first couple of years, look very similar to Parkinson's disease. Um, but over time, your symptoms can actually change so that you are kind of deviating from what would be expected from Parkinson's disease. And so in a person with Parkinsonism, it's also a dopamine disorder. And that's where a DAT scan actually is not as helpful. So if I'm between Parkinson's disease and a cousin of Parkinson's, a DAT scan is not going to help me con con conclusively say Parkinson's disease. Whereas with someone with an essential tremor, which is not a dopamine disease, or who's on medication that blocks dopamine instead of um, changes the amount of dopamine in the brain, that's where a DAT scan can be a conclusive test. So that's not a, a totally clear answer, but that's kind of how we use it. Fantastic. Thank you. I hope that uh, that helps clarify for, for Dan and Anne. So you mentioned Parkinsonism, this concept of the cousins of Parkinson's disease. And Brendan asks a question, how applicable are your you know, go-to guide, what happens when I'm diagnosed with exercise, diet, all the things you mentioned, how applicable are those uh, points to a diagnosis of Parkinsonism versus Parkinson's disease? It's a great question. Um, 
I wish we had a better biomarker to say for sure which um, Parkinsonism you may have. But the thing that we do know is that regardless of which Parkinsonism cousin of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease that you have, we think that exercise and a healthy Mediterranean diet will help all of it. So again, these are things that are are known to be good for the brain. I actually have seen a colleague say, I wish we would stop doing trials on exercise because it's never been shown to not be helpful. Exercise is helpful all the time. And so these are my go-to guides, regardless of what flavor of Parkinsonism you have, I would say. Where it becomes a little bit more of a conversation is at medication. So some Parkinsonisms are either more sensitive to medication or actually don't respond as well to medication. And that may be something that is not as clear cut um, between Parkinson's disease and the cousins of Parkinson's. Thank you very much. So you talked a little bit about when is a good time to start medication. You mentioned that there's no one size fits all answer. Now, Ed has a specific question about starting medication. Does it make sense to actually delay starting medication? I would like to start today, but I'm not going to because I want it to work for a longer amount of time. What are your thoughts about that? I love this question. I love it because it's probably the thing that people ask me the most and the thing that I find I'm often counseling patients on. The the reality is that we have wonderful medications for Parkinson's disease that can help treat your symptoms and can keep you moving for a very, very long time. But ultimately, the brain continues to change. And so it's not that medicine stops working after a magic number, such as three years, five years, 10 years. It's that your brain continues to change. And so I never delay medication for someone who needs it. If you are having functional impairment, if you are having a hard time having good quality of life, it is worth starting medication regardless of how early you are in your disease or how young you are when you're diagnosed. So I don't ever hold medication for someone who needs it because I'm worried about it not working down the road. I just know that we may have to be more creative down the road in terms of adding medication to that dopamine or using multiple medications or doing advanced treatments, things like deep brain stimulation or a Duopa pump. There are lots of options. And so I never hold medication because it will always work. It's just a matter of what your limit's going to be and, and how much more we have to add to it over time. Fantastic. What I like to say to patients when I get asked this question is, well, if we think that, and we do think that exercise is neuroprotective, and now without medication, you're not maximally exercising, then you're shooting yourself in the foot by not taking medication because you're not getting that benefit of exercise. So you really have to think about it um, you know, more broadly sometimes as well. Great now we have a fantastic question from Donna, now that we're on uh, the topic of medications. And this is such a good question because I think it gets really confused for people. What symptoms can you expect medication to help with? Good question. Um, it is a little bit specific for each person. So every medication um, people respond differently to. So I often think of our four um, cardinal motor symptoms as the things that we're targeting with the medication. So we're often trying to treat that tremor. We're trying to treat the stiffness. We're trying to treat the slowness. The symptom that's always the trickiest is the posture. So sometimes the posture doesn't respond to medication. Sometimes the medication can make you dizzy or make your blood pressure drop. And so we're actually worsening your posture and your balance. So those are things that don't necessarily um, respond to the medication the same way that the tremor or the stiffness or the slowness do. Now, tremors also also tricky because some patients can actually have a really what we call refractory tremor, where even at pretty good doses of medication, the tremor doesn't always go away. And so we have to sometimes add other medications or think about other procedures to try and help with tremor. But I would say when you're first starting medication, the things you're definitely looking for are your slowness, your stiffness, your shuffling of your feet. Those are the symptoms you really want to be looking for to improve. Fantastic. So again, questions are coming in of all types. Um, I really like this one from Anne because we get asked this a lot. Is there any way to know what the progression of a person's Parkinson's will be? Um, and specifically, maybe somebody young onset versus not young onset. Is there anything you can tell somebody who's newly diagnosed about their progression? That is a great question. Um, there are a couple things that we know just from looking at large populations. So it seems that people who have a tremor may progress a little bit slower than people without a tremor. And it seems that people who are younger are going to progress a little bit slower and have the disease for a lot longer. But within that, there's a lot of, of variation and there's a lot of uniqueness to um, 
how a patient's going to progress. What I tell my patients is over the next year to two years, I'm going to learn more about your Parkinson's disease because it's your Parkinson's disease. It's not the next person's Parkinson's disease. And that's going to help me know how you're going to progress. So everyone is a little bit different there. And really, the more you see your neurologist over time, the better um, understanding of whether you're a slow progressor, whether you're an average progressor, um, the, the doctor will, will be able to guide you with that and, and what to expect. Great. We have a question from Donna, which has come up a few times in various uh, ways. Uh, Donna has nausea with her medications. And what percentage of people who start medications have a side effect like nausea? And what can you do about that? Is, does taking the medication with meals help? Anything else to suggest about nausea? Yeah, nausea is by far the most common side effect of starting to take carbidopa levodopa. And actually, fun fact, its its brand name was called Cinemet because the carbidopa being added onto the levodopa was supposed to stop the nausea and vomiting. So it was supposed to be without emesis or without vomiting. So Cinemet. Um, that's your history lesson for the day. Uh, but there are still some people who that 25 of the carbidopa isn't enough to alleviate the nausea and they still get nauseous with it. And I would say that it, it happens pretty frequently, at least 25 to 30% of my patients, I would say, have it. So I usually guide them that it's going to work the best on an empty stomach. But if you're nauseous, please try crackers or toast or some sort of carbohydrate with the pill to try and help that. For some people, that doesn't work either. Um, and, and they may have to take it with more like more of a, a full meal. Now, there's a lot of question about protein, and this may come up in your questions as well, about the fact that protein gets absorbed in your intestines at the same place that the dopamine gets absorbed. And so you um, run a risk that your meds won't work as well if you're taking it with a full meal, especially one that's rich in protein. Um, I always tell people I may we may just have to increase your dose higher to overcome that, or we can sometimes add more of that carbidopa. So it does come in its own separate pill. And so some people, instead of 25, 100, milligrams, they need 50, 100 milligrams. And so that's where I will mix and match and try to try to help with that. But the first step is definitely try it with toast or crackers um, or some sort of carbohydrate. Fantastic. Um, we have a question from Junior Warrior. A great name. Um, can one increase medications on bad days for a temporary pick-me-up? Um, so can you talk about uh, whether you can modify medications day by day. And that has a, another question about medications. Can you talk about medications losing their effect over time? You mentioned a little bit about this, maybe elaborate on that a little. Yeah, sure. So I like this question, and this is, is really dependent on um, how your doctor practices and, and the relationship you have with them. I would say that we know the medicine works best when you take it consistently. So that means you can't just take it as needed. You have to have a certain level of the medicine in your bloodstream for it to work. That's why for most people starting carbidopa, levodopa, you take it three times a day. Um, that being said, I have so many patients who on bad days, they need an extra half a tab in the morning because they just can't get going. Or before they exercise, they need an extra half a tab because their exercise uses up more of their dopamine. And even though they feel good afterwards because exercise helps their symptoms, they also need a little bit more to get through the exercise. And so I do often tell people that you can use a little bit extra here and there. I often say just a half a tablet. Um, but again, there are some physicians who do not feel like that. They would like to increase the medicine most consistently over time. So that's a conversation definitely to have with your doctor. In terms of it losing its effect, again, over time, your brain is going to change. And so it's going to need more medicine. And more medicine may come in the um, it may actually look like more frequent medicine instead of more medicine with each dose. And so sometimes we actually can get to the same out outcome by instead of doing three times a day, doing four times a day. So you'll find, we call it on and off periods. So you'll find that your medicine works and it kicks in, but then you start to wear off before your next dose. And so that's often a sign that we either need to add something to enhance your levodopa, or you need to smush them closer together, or we need to increase the dose. And again, that's a conversation that you and your doctor can have to talk about what's best for your life. Fantastic. A lot of options, a lot to discuss with your doctor about individualizing a medication regimen. We have another great question. We're moving a little bit away from medications and a little bit to what, why did this happen to me? Mm. Um, are there benefits to being tested to determine if you have a gene specifically for Parkinson's or perhaps uh, delving a little bit into an environmental cause? Is there a reason to sort of delve into why Parkinson's developed in you? 
It's a really, really fantastic question. Um, there are some things that we know put people at higher risk of having Parkinson's disease. And one of them for sure is your exposure to certain things in the environment. So when looking at whole big population studies, we've actually found that people who are more likely to be exposed to things like pesticides or Agent Orange or other chemicals are at higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Now that's, it's always really tricky because it's hard to know exactly how much people were exposed to and exactly which chemical, because a lot of times people are exposed to multiple chemicals. Pesticides don't usually, when you're a farmer, say, you don't usually use one, you use multiple for different things. So those are definitely um, things that we think of as risk factors. Um, but it's really, really hard to say for certain, this is the thing that caused your Parkinson's disease. Now, the question about genetics, I think is really interesting because we're learning more and more about the genes that might be associated or might put someone at risk for Parkinson's disease. We often don't do routine genetic testing on someone over the age of 65, who is kind of in that average age for developing Parkinson's disease. But on our young onset Parkinson's patients, so people who are younger than 50 who develop their symptoms, we will sometimes test them for genetic causes. And we we know of a handful of genes that definitely are implicated in increasing the risk of Parkinson's disease. So we will look for those. There are some studies now in some universities actually looking at, can we find more genes and can we find genes in patients who are of the older and more common um, age to develop Parkinson's disease? And so some people are getting their whole genome tested just to look and see if we can find common genes amongst patients with Parkinson's disease. So keep your eyes open. I think there's going to be more coming in that. Great. We have a, a wonderful question from Ed who asks, what is LSVT and is it something that should be done early or late? There was a corollary question earlier on from Anne, which uh, asked, does it make sense to start a program like LSVT early or do you want to see if medications help before you start a program like that? What are your thoughts? That's a great question. I think there is no like perfect time for LSVT. I think early is a great time to start LSVT. And the reason is I think of LSVT as a retraining program. So in Parkinson's, the things that used to become very automatic. So swinging your arms when you walk, getting up out of a chair quickly and starting your steps, those become things you now have to concentrate on and, and really be more volitional about doing them. And LSVT is really made to, to, keep retraining your brain to make those big movements, to make those loud, um, to, to project your voice and, and to do all of those big movements so that your body is actually moving in a more smooth and fluid way. So I really like LSVT at all stages, um, but really early on and kind of at times in which you feel like you're you're having worsening in your walking, in your arm swing, in your posture, those are times when I will re-order um, LSVT for my patients. Great. And just to clarify, LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Technique. It's actually started as a speech therapy program, or just as Dr. Bissonnette said, it encourages you to speak sort of louder than you think you should. Uh, and then the corollary in physical therapy is move bigger than you think you should. And that sort of compensate for some of the problems that we see in Parkinson's with a, with a soft voice and small movement. So it's a, a Parkinson specific uh, speech and, and exercise program. So thanks Ed and Anne for uh, bringing that up for us. Um, we have a great question from Robert, which is my doctor only sees me every six months and I feel that they, that may not be enough. So Dr. Bissonnette, what's your philosophy on that? It's a really, it's a really tough question right now, especially. I think that, um, as you all felt during COVID, the medical system has become um, harder to get into and, and people are often being seen every six months. I like to see my patients between three and four months, but that doesn't always happen for, for everybody. And so what I would say is I tell my patients to make sure if something is changing or they feel like they need to talk about something to make sure that they call, make sure that you leave a message or you send an email so that I know that something is happening between those six month or four month visits so that we can try to get you in earlier or so that you can, um, we can make adjustments over the phone before I, I see you again. We have actually a Carly question from Sandra, who's a newly diagnosed person and her doctor wants to see her every five weeks. What do you think about that? I think that's wonderful. I wish I could see my patients every five weeks. Um, I, I, 
I wonder if your physician will actually see you as your starting medicine and your tweaking medicine every five weeks. To, and again, the more you see your doctor, the more they're going to understand your disease. And so once they get a sense of you, it may be that they'll actually space it out a little bit more. And I do that sometimes. If I'm starting a new regimen, I'll see someone in four weeks because I don't want them to go longer without telling me that either they're having side effects or they don't feel as good or they're falling at home. Those are things that I want to make sure we're keeping up on. And so um, every five weeks, I think, is great. Um, it will be up to you and the doctor, I think, eventually, if that continues long term. Okay, fantastic. We have a great question from Thomas, and this is a topic we have not at all discussed yet, and that's a topic of dyskinesias. Mm. Uh, dyskinesias are uh, sort of abnormal movements that can come as a side effect of levodopa. Thomas asks, what percentage of Parkinson's patients get dyskinesias? Could you maybe elaborate on the concept of dyskinesias and how to think about it if you're newly diagnosed? Sure, that's great. Um, and, and Dr. Gilbert, you may have to give me an actual number if you know the number, because I'm not actually sure the percentage of patients who get dyskinesias. I know that it is a common side effect over time when you've been treated with levodopa, especially as we increase the dose of the levodopa. So what happens again is you get these peaks and valleys at some point, you, what we call motor fluctuations, um, and it happens very frequently. So it's not something that we worry about. It means that you're necessarily at the end of Parkinson's. We, we, we see it often, um, and it's something where you're medicine kicks on and then it starts to wear off. And usually at that kicking on and at the peak dose, you can get extra movements. And so these are things like if you were to watch, I use Michael J. Fox as the example because he's the most commonly seen person with Parkinson's disease, but his extra movements are often what we consider dyskinesia. So they're almost wiggling dance-like movements that are different than a rust tremor that the, the patient experiences. And early on when people get dyskinesia, they often don't notice them. They might be very subtle. They might be very small. They might come only for a little bit of time. And I had a patient once tell me, I feel better being on with dyskinesias than being off without them. And I think early on that's true. But there does come a point where dyskinesias can be bothersome or can get in the way of your ability to sit in a chair or walk without falling. And so there are um, medications we can try to actually pre prevent or treat the dyskinesias. And there, again, are, are other therapies that people may be a candidate for. So these are things like deep brain stimulation, which can sometimes help reduce the amount of medication so you don't have dyskinesias or actually treat the dyskinesias itself. Very good. Um, we have a great question from Dave. And uh, he says, I was diagnosed about a year ago and he's very committed to exercise, rap steady boxing, yoga, etc. He's on a little bit of medication as well. And he feels better now than he did before he was diagnosed. So would this be considered a Parkinson's regression rather than progression? How would you answer, Dave? That is a really wonderful question. I love the idea of something like Parkinson's regression. I think that probably what's happening is that your Parkinson's had been happening slowly over years before you were first diagnosed. And the reality is that you probably feel now like you did probably 10 years before. And that's because we're doing, you're doing a great, great job with your exercise regimen. You are not only staving off your symptoms, but with the little bit of carbidopa levodopa that you're taking, you probably feel much better than you have in, in, in a really, really long time. So is that regression? I think it's just good treatment would be my answer, not necessarily regression, but keep in touch with us, Dave, because you might be the secret. Perfect. Fantastic. We have a, a completely new topic to discuss from Goose1953. Um, can you speak about participation in, in trials? Um, I was diagnosed two years ago. I've been involved in two clinical trials. What, uh, what do you have to say to our newly diagnosed cohort who are listening today about participation in a trial? I'm so glad that Goose 1953 brought this up. Um, and, and thank you for participating in trials. I think it's actually really difficult for people to want to, especially when they're still digesting having Parkinson's disease and, and learning what, what it entails to, to say yes to participating in trials. So thank you. Um, I think clinical trials are a wonderful way to not only potentially try a new drug, but to actually help us understand how these drugs affect patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, they have the potential to really change the landscape of um, how we treat 
Parkinson's. Uh, one thing about the new trials is that they actually are looking for people who are newly diagnosed. So a lot of times the trials are trying to slow the disease down. And we think that the best time to start intervening is actually very, very early in the disease. So a lot of new trials, actually, you can't ever have been on medication and you should be diagnosed within the, within the last couple of years. And so that's a really great opportunity for those of you who are newly diagnosed to potentially try something new. Um, some of these trials are not necessarily drug trials. There are exercise trials that are out there where they're looking for very early, mild symptoms, newly diagnosed patients who've never been on medication. And so it's an opportunity to try a new exercise regimen and potentially see what could, can we give better advice in terms of what the best exercise or what the best intensity is? So I think this is a great time to look into um, clinical trials and think about joining if you're interested. Thank you for that. We have a similar question from both Jill and Sharon. So Sharon asks, I have dystonia and that can sometimes be worse when I exercise. So how do I know if I'm exercising too much or too little? Um, uh, Jill asked a related question. How much should you be pushing yourself in exercise? If I'm not feeling quite right, should I just keep going? Should I stop? What is your advice on that? Yeah, it's a great question because there is a fine line. There, There is kind of a fine line between doing too much and then the next day or after exercise being really exhausted and, and really feeling like you're um, – worse off than you were before you exercise. What again we say is is moderate intensity. If you find that you're having a hard time getting through exercise, listen to your body. That's what I, I tell my patients. If you really can't do it, shorten it up. Start doing small chunks of time. Start taking more frequent breaks. It doesn't have to be all at once and it doesn't have to be very intense to get the benefit of exercise. And that's something that is really important to stress. Dystonia with exercise is really an interesting question. And, and this kind of gets to the point of with, with Parkinson's, sometimes we have to try things to understand, is it too much or too little? So that can happen with medicine too. Is it that you're exercising and you're using up dopamine and therefore you're, you're kind of in an off state? Or is it that you're exercising and you're kind of in a better state and that dystonia is going to come out no matter what? One nice thing about dystonia is that we can sometimes treat it without medic without oral medication, so with something called Botox, um, and that can last for months. And we can sometimes do that um, to help you be able to exercise fully without having that dystonia come out, regardless of if it's caused from too much or too little exercise. Very good. Now we're going to uh, bring up another topic which has not been mentioned so far. This is not necessarily a topic that people who are newly diagnosed often have, but Mavis brings it up and, and we'd like to address her question is, why do I forget things more than ever? Is this dementia? Is this part of Parkinson's? What do I do if I'm noticing some cognitive changes? Yeah, I love this question because I think that there is um, a big stigma around forgetfulness and, and forgetting things. Um, there's a couple different things that forgetfulness can mean. And a lot of times what people think is I walk into a room and I, I forget what I went in there for, or I can't find my keys sometimes, or the most common one I see is I lose words. So I'm in the middle of a sentence, I lose my train of thought, I lose track of what I'm saying, and I can't come up with a word like a name or um, something I'm, I'm trying to say. Um, and then it'll come back to me a couple a couple of minutes or even a couple hours later. Um, it can be really, really frustrating. Um, one thing that we know with Parkinson's disease is that the types of cognitive changes that occur are exactly this. They're focus and attention. They're what we call working memory. So your ability to hold something in your memory while you're doing other tasks. So this, this what I like to say, the myth of multitasking, that we should all be able to multitask, really gets... Um, kind of blown apart with Parkinson's disease. It gets really hard to focus on multiple things. Many people will tell me being in a restaurant is really hard because there's a lot of noise and to be able to focus on one conversation with other things going on around um, can be really difficult. And that again is that kind of attention and focus. It's very common in Parkinson's. It does not mean dementia. So that's something that I always try to stress to my patients. It's very different than what we think of as true, um, like an Alzheimer's memory loss or a true dementia. It is, it is a problem with what we call executive functioning. Now, some people can actually have a really good um, kind of 
resolution of this when they start medications. So the the fog can actually um, be lifted is what they, they tell me and they can focus a little bit better. For some patients, exercise can do this. Um, sometimes this is a sign that you're anxious and that you have some underlying anxiety. And so treating your anxiety can really help the symptom. And then for other um, patients, I will sometimes try a medication that can help um, with focus. So that can sometimes be things that are like stimulants. It can sometimes be things that we use traditionally for dementia, but instead we're using it to help people pay attention. So lots of options here. And please don't worry that being a little bit forgetful, word finding problems are dementia. It's very, very common in Parkinson's. Great. Now we have a corollary question because people uh, are, of course, very interested in this topic, which is how often does dementia develop in people with Parkinson's? So for people who have Parkinson's for many decades, dementia can, can become more common. So over time, it can be um, it can be a higher percentage. So, but I would say that it's only about, and again, Dr. Gilbert, if I get my numbers wrong here, I want to say it's about 15% of people, but again, that's over time. So it's in, the, in their lifespan. It's very rare to have it happen early if it's true Parkinson's disease. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, dementia early on, you know, in, in a newly diagnosed cohort is very rare. Um, but as the disease progresses, it does become more common, unfortunately. But uh, um, something that we're furiously working on, which brings us to the next question, which is from Rebecca, which is uh, the question that had popped up a, a minute earlier, which is what promising research is out there to, to, to stave off this disease and uh, to treat symptoms like, uh, like dementia? What's out there? Yeah, great question. Um, we, we often joke in, in our practice that it's time for new things. Stop giving me different types of levodopa. Um, and that's what I think we're all looking for and all waiting for. Just, just like you all are, we're waiting for something that really is, is going to truly slow down this disease. And the nice thing is that there is some really promising research happening, looking at how to stop that abnormal protein, so that alpha-synuclein protein. Now, some of those trials have already started. Some of them have closed and not been as successful, but there is um, a lot being done working with genes to try and stop proteins for degenerative diseases. So um, looking at how do we stop the alpha-synuclein from being formed abnormally? How do we stop it from collecting within the, the brain cells? Those are trials that are, are actively ongoing. And so they, they hold some promise there. And I think the earlier we can pick people up, the earlier people join trials, the better off we're going to be for that. The other things that they're looking at is whether or not doing things like deep brain stimulation early can actually slow down tremor progression. And is that something that actually changes the brain over time? So there's some really promising trials happening. If you're interested in participating in a trial, something like clinicaltrials.gov can be really helpful, although it's a little bit hard to, to maneuver. Michael J. Fox Foundation also has something called a trial finder, and that's a little bit easier to use where you can actually put in where you're from um, and it can help you find clinical trials that are active and enrolling around you. Fantastic, because that answered a question that had, that had popped up as well. As you mentioned clinical trials, how do you find out about them? So thank you for uh, those two websites, clinicaltrials.gov and the Michael J. Fox Trial Finder. That those, that's great information. We are actually uh, nearing the end of our uh, time, which is uh, incredible. There have been an enormous number of questions. We've tried to cover uh, as many as we possibly could. I'm gonna end with one, which kind of brings a bunch of them together. Um, Layla asked a question and uh, some other people asked related questions. Um, there seems to be other symptoms that are involved in Parkinson's disease that maybe you didn't we didn't mention yet. Voice, for example, vision. Um, are these, you know, if I have trouble with my vision, is that Parkinson's disease? If I have trouble with my voice, is that Parkinson's disease? How do I assess that and what do I do about these, these other symptoms? Yeah, that's such a fantastic question. I think there's kind of two key points here. One is that Parkinson's is a whole body sim uh, syndrome. And so it's not just about the brain. It's also about your gut. It's also about your urinary tract. So there's a lot of symptoms of Parkinson's that are outside of just your movement and just what's happening in your brain. Voice is a very common one. Handwriting, as we mentioned, smell. Um, that being said, this is where having a healthcare team is really, really important because sometimes it's not Parkinson's disease. And how do you know the difference? And the answer is your, your, your providers are the people to help you kind of 
figure that out. And so this is where I tell people letting your neurologist know and letting your primary care doctor know what you're experiencing is really important. Sometimes it's a sign of a urinary tract infection and not just your Parkinson's disease when you're having to go to the bathroom more frequently. And that's really important to figure out because they're treated differently. And so having both a primary care doctor that you're seeing regularly and a neurologist that you're seeing regularly, and hopefully those two people can talk to each other, um, can actually help you not have to worry about is this Parkinson's or is this not? This is where your team can really help you. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, so we are at the end of our time. And so I wanted to thank Dr. Bissonnette so much for all that wonderful information. I also want to thank everyone for participating today in today's discussion uh, because the questions were fantastic so on point, and I hope we were able to give you a little bit of information. Now you can, this is being recorded, it's gonna be on our website uh, you know, momentarily. So if you missed today's program, if you joined late, if you would like to watch it again, if you wanna refer someone else to it, uh, please uh, go to our YouTube channel, our APDA YouTube channel, and it will be there. And at that time, don't forget to subscribe to APDA's YouTube channel, and you'll be able to watch new videos and live broadcasts. Now for additional uh, information and resources, please visit our website at apdaparkinson.org. Flashing up on the screen uh, during this broadcast was uh, information about how to get our informative PD handbook and exercise guide. Uh, people who are first diagnosed may find those particular publications useful, so please go and check that out. I wanted to mention our next episode of Dr. Gilbert Host, which will be on Wednesday, April 27th. And I'm going to be hosting four guests who have long-standing Parkinson's disease. So the opposite of, of today's, where we were focusing on early diagnosis, these four guests have had Parkinson's together for decades, and they have a lot of experience navigating the disease, and they want to take your questions in a similar way as we did today. So I want you to tune into Decades with Parkinson's Disease, Ask Me Anything on April 27th, and that's going to be at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you enjoyed today's program, we hope you will consider supporting APDA with a donation because with your help, APDA can deliver more programs and services like this one. Again, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you soon on another APDA program. Have a wonderful afternoon. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org slash events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.